Amphibia Season 3 is already starting to be quite the wild ride, as this week the planters struggle to adapt to the new lifestyle, while Sasha and Grime prepare to bring the fight back to Andreas' doorstep, giving us a great heaping of character development and a really fun action set piece. This is our breakdown of Season 3, Episode 2. Hop to you drop and turning point. As always, we're going to run through easter eggs, details you may have missed, and sprinkle in some theories. To stay in the loop of all things Amphibia during our Season 3 coverage, please be sure to subscribe to the Roundtable with notifications on so you never miss a video. That being said, let's dive in. It's pretty obvious that Season 3 of Amphibia emits more anime energy than ever. Matt even joked about it months ago while it was knee-deep in its production, but the show mimics a lot of anime in a very clever way with these past two episodes. For anime that run multiple seasons with breaks in between, or even with the first episode of an anime in general, it's not uncommon for a premiere to forgo the reveal of a new opening in favor of a longer runtime, but still include the end credits for that particular season, introducing the opening in the following episode. Amphibia Season 3 does exactly this. The New Normal uses the shortened version of the show's intro in order to fit in more content, but still included the new high-energy end credits sequence, animated by Jen Strickland, director of the show. This week's episode is the first to actually feature Season 3's action-packed new opening. We did a breakdown of it months ago, check that out if you haven't already, or if you want to see which theories have been right or wrong so far. I'm not sure if this anime parallel was intentional on the Amphibia crew's part, but if it's a coincidence, it's a rather fun one. There's also some revisions made to the new intro, and in the planters escaping Sword Frobo in the alleyway, now in includes a little Gideon plush being knocked over. Marcy's rejuvenation tank has been altered from a blue tent to a green tent, reflective of her former connection to the green calamity gem. There's now sound effects accompanying King Andreas' blade. And last but not least, Marcy's inclusion in the final shot before the logo has been replaced with Domino. And to be honest, I completely expected this. Marcy's render in the earlier version of this intro was the only one recycled from the Season 2 poster, while the rest of the characters had brand new poses. She felt shoehorned into the opening as a potential compromise to get True Colors on air, a way to assure the viewer that she was alive, given how Disney treats True Colors if it's the darkest thing kids have ever seen, but I digress. Hop to You Drop opens with the planters driving Anne absolutely insane due to their naive approach to socializing on Earth. Your world is soft, Anne. I mean, the animals don't even try to disembowel you. Polly's beefing with other kids, Pop Pop becomes the target of con artists everywhere due to his age, and Sprig is on the verge of winding up as a Final Destination set piece. Don't try any of this at home. I know the fan is tempting. Going back to Hop Hop, millions of elderly Americans wind up a victim of various schemes and financial fraud. Seniors racking up more than $3 billion in losses annually. It's not just because of their age and presumed disconnect from our technology, but since they're old, they're likely to have savings and favorable credit. So this running gag throughout the episode was grounded in the pretty shitty reality we live in. The social security form still made me cackle. Anne's mom and dad point out how her responsibility over the planters is akin to parenting children, which was a cute moment that served to reflect how the tables have turned on Anne. She's the one looking after the planters now, not the other way around. It's a shift in dynamic that even throws Hop Hop off. Since when did you set the stage? Hoping to get the planters acclimated to life in Los Angeles, and decides to throw them face first into a mall adventure, going against their parents' advice of easing the planters into everything, thinking it'll work out for them, like how being thrown into the insanity of Amphibia worked out for her. Of course, hijinks ensue. We also have a barrage of Easter eggs. Polly briefly dons the nose and ears of rich capitalist Mickey Mouse, before tossing the pieces aside. Because she recognizes that monopolies are bad for everyone. Spriggs seems to stumble upon an art exhibit, which I didn't know malls had in America, but I guess if it was anywhere, it'd be LA. And one of the pieces is of the iconic cactar species from the Final Fantasy franchise. There's also a callback to Hop Hop's former full head of hair with one of the mall scams. You there! Do you want to regrow that hair? I know you do! And I'm gonna be honest, I've never actually seen Paul Blart beyond clips and memes, but the mall cop definitely had huge Paul Blart energy. And runs into a peer from school, who clues us in that none of Anne's classmates were sure if she went missing. Some even speculated that she died, but at large, it seems as if it was treated like a rumor, giving Anne an easy out to lie about her previous whereabouts. Don't be ridiculous, Gabby. I was just at my family's farm in Alaska for five months. Another instance of Anne lying to cover up Amphibia's existence and the severity of the situation. I definitely think everything's going to come to light and blow up in her face at once. And I do think it's kind of weird that the show is glossing over their disappearance and not really dramatizing it, given they were gone for half a year. But I suppose they don't want to keep the series dark and emotional every single episode of the season. The show is still on Disney Channel after all. The peer interacting with Anne is named Gabby, who has a resemblance to Anne's school bully, Maggie. 
So I wonder if they're related, possibly sisters or cousins. I know a lot of fans want to see Maggie pop up again, which would make sense, so we can see how Anne would approach her after all of her character growth. Makes me think that Gabby's introduction here could have been a clever setup. Next week's episode, Tie Feud, seems as if it'll be the one to introduce the undercover FBI agents, so I wonder if this episode will have some unforeseen consequences. Perhaps down the road, we'll learn that the mall security cameras had surveillance of the planters when they were off their A-game. Their clumsiness coming back to bite them in the ass. Honestly, I can't tell the difference. Ooh, hey, bada bing! But now we move on to the main event of this week, Turning Point. A Sasha and Grime episode this early on in the season. How could we be so lucky? We turn the clock back to the final moments of True Colors, showcasing how Marcy's heartbreaking fall went down from Sasha's point of view, and the aftermath from the castle. Additional and alternate footage includes Andrea swinging his sword at Grime and Sasha after Sasha assures Anne that they'll hold him off. We're shown Sasha crashing into the wall and flopping to the ground as King Andreas runs past her in pursuit of the Calamity Box. Another angle of Marcy's impalement alongside Sasha's reaction? The look on her face highlights how she's in complete shock, calling out Marcy's name in horror just as Anne did. And as the Calamity Box sends Anne and the planters to Earth, the throne room is engulfed in a colorful blinding light, which straight up looked like a ray from the outside. As everything cools down, smoke can be seen emerging from the Calamity Box, which I believe displayed how much power was needed from the gems to send four organic beings through the portal at once. I actually edited together the end of True Colors and the beginning of Turning Point over on my Twitter, if you want to go check it out and give me a follow at Ashrick Vox. And I'm on Instagram at the same handle. As Andreas reclaims the box, Yunin and Olivia have their covers blown in the midst of an escape. Yunin squeezing Olivia's hand as she guides her to safety. Andreas questions where their allegiance falls after his heel turn, which prompts the two to lie without giving it a second thought, declaring their loyalty to Andreas and his true ambitions. Though we know they'll form plans of their own to rescue Marcy, plans that will likely go awry. Yunin was one of my most anticipated characters coming into Season 2, so her limited role in the story thus far kinda bummed me out, but I understand she's a supporting character. That being said, it makes me very happy that her and Olivia have their own subplot in this final season, with their own dedicated episode included. Speaking of Marcy, Andrews commands Yunin and Olivia to put her body inside of her rejuvenation tank as soon as possible, stating that Marcy's fading fast. This solidifies that Andreas' sword doesn't stun his adversaries or anything that skirts around death. For all intents and purposes, we practically did watch Marcy die, Andreas putting her in a position where she would have passed away in a tragic manner if she didn't receive proper aid. Grimes' arc in this episode is set up from his very first line of dialogue, turning his back on Marcy and forcing Sasha to do the same just as he encourages her to do with the villagers of Wartwood later. Grime has always had a habit of looking out for only himself and his crew. Throughout season 2, he's had Sasha's back, but no one else's. Now, he's learning to give a damn about Wartwood as well, repaying them for their hospitality despite all that's happened in the past. Thanks to the help of Joe Sparrow, Sasha and Grime flee to Wartwood, the place where Sasha will have to face the consequences of her actions throughout the story thus far. Her guilt over betraying Anne, pushing the girls around and holding all of Wartwood hostage with their lives in peril. Everything that went down in True Colors wasn't the fault of one individual, but rather an accumulation of Anne, Sasha, and Marcy's downfalls, as it left a huge blind spot that Andreas took advantage of. However, due to Sasha's fallout with Anne right before things went from bad to worse, and Marcy's in-the-moment death, the guilt weighing Sasha down is immovable. She feels as if she hasn't earned the right to enter the planter's household, sleeping on top of a pile of hay in the barn instead, which allows her to bond with Bessie and Michelangelo, who probably picked up on her sad vibes and wasn't going to let it slide. When they first arrive in Wartwood, Sasha has a similar dilemma to what Anne's facing on Earth. Not wanting to send the villagers into a panic, Sasha and Grimes settle on a half-truth, revealing Andreas' true nature as a ruthless tyrant, but fudging the details on Anne and the planter's whereabouts and why Sasha and Grime are even there in the first place. What do we tell them? Not the truth, that's for sure. This also allowed us to see the unified group of Wartwood. Instead of showing prejudice towards Sasha and Grime for the cruel actions in the past, and Sasha's very existence as a human being, they welcome them with open arms, trusting the pair without question. It's a small way to show that both Anne and Marcy really help them let go of their biases and accept a helping hand from those coming in from the outside, to not judge a book by its cover and recognize that everyone has the capability to change. Wally has a brief interaction with Sasha, inadvertently making her feel worse as he talks about how Anne has shown him the importance of honesty, but going into this episode, I was wondering if Wally's family ties will lead into something big when it comes to support for the Brewing Rebellion. It's still a possibility, but for now the two can at least say they're acquainted. 
Grime receives a letter from Beatrix, confirming that his sister did survive the events of True Colors, after Andreas blew a tow tower to smithereens, leaving any possible death toll ambiguous to the audience. Now we can assume she was either heading into Newtopia with the rest of the army, or was planning to lay low from the start, evading capture all the same. Beatrix informs Grime that plans are already in motion to take a stand and fight back against Andreas, hiding underground with a few other lucky toads. They have amassed soldiers, weapons, and defenses, so the war that was started in True Colors continues to rage on. The political landscape of Amphibia seems as if it'll be crucial to the season. As I speculated before, Sasha will likely be responsible for uniting the frogs, toads, and newts together, which means tensions will have to be addressed, and what everyone wants for Amphibia's future will have to come into question. Sasha and Grimes' conversation is interrupted by the arrival of a dark Frobo, which they make quick work of, but not before the robot manages to send a signal for reinforcements, setting a timer of destruction for Wartwood. After some tough love from Grime, Sasha gets the push she needs to confront her guilt by stepping foot into Anne's room, reading the recent entry in Anne's journal that just smashes her heart into even more pieces. Sasha learns how thrilled Anne was to reconnect with her and reach an understanding something Anne desired and held out for since the very moment they clashed. Tears falling on Anne's doodle of their Battle of the Bands costumes. Sasha finally acknowledges her faults, regretting her desperate need for control. Wanting to atone for her manipulation and deceit, Sasha decides to put an end to this toxic behavior and turn everything around. You could say this is the turning point for her character arc. Sasha declares she wants to be someone who deserves Anne. Which is an ambiguous line that I'm sure a lot of viewers will read with romantic implications, and I'm sure that was intentional to a degree. Shipping's never really been my forte, so I have no strong feelings towards it either way. But hey, give the people what they want. The close-up of Sasha's eyes are also an inverse of two previous close-ups we've seen of the character, from the episode Reunion. However, this time, the beam of light is larger, extending itself outward, symbolizing that Sasha is letting go of those controlling tendencies and broadening her perspective factoring in what other people think and feel. I will say, I'm surprised they didn't work in the vast amount of weapons within the hidden chambers of the planter farm, at least in this episode, but I suppose it would have been a bit too early to tie into the story. Sasha begins to make amends of herself by coming clean to everyone about the impending robot attack and the true whereabouts of Anne and the planters, expressing both her regret and drive to improve, declaring, With my last breath, I'm gonna defend this town! which mirrors a line of dialogue from Reunion. Are you really gonna risk your life for these talking frogs? A great way to showcase Sasha turning a new leaf. The Monster of the Week is a gigantic Frobo that sits on all fours, strapped with cannons for arms, a torpedo firing core, and a buttload of stretchy arm robots that are fired out of its shoulder pads. Can I just say, that's video game boss battle as fuck. Big Sonic vibes. Also, the music when the robot strikes features the same leitmotif as the Grand Robot Awakening in True Colors. The villagers of Wartwood put their season one slapstick to use, recontextualized under a different light. One that's a little more pumped up of adrenaline, yet still has that amphibia touch of goofiness. They put up a great fight against the robots, tearing them all down without breaking a sweat, which blows Sasha and Grime away, as frogs are typically looked down upon in the amphibia hierarchy. Toes are supposed to be the natural born fighters, so to see such valiant effort from those they route up as farmers shifts the way Sasha and Grime looks at them. When it comes to Grime, they've earned his respect as as warriors. And the feeling is mutual, as Wartwood now has true respect for Sasha and Grime. With everyone now seeing eye to eye, Sasha decides it's now time to start fighting back. The war against Andreas is truly underway. I don't know when the next time we'll see Wartwood will be, but I assume this new rebellion will have significant advancements when we check in on them down the road. And that's about everything we have for this episode. As always, I want to know your thoughts. What's your takeaway from these episodes? What other forces do you believe could join this rebellion? Let us know down below or over at Roundtable Vids on Twitter and Instagram. If you enjoyed this video, please sort of like and subscribe to the Roundtable for more great cartoon content. Thank you for watching and I hope you have an amazing day. See ya!